on this final day, we'll talk about the benefits and fruits of making a meditation retreat. In brief, we can call this knowledge of transcendent matters which can solve problems in ordinary life. Knowledge about Loguttara Dhamma, the Dhamma that leads beyond the world. The problems of ordinary life can be summarized in three words. In time, we call them the three ga, gin, gam, giet, and in English, the three Fs, food, flesh, and fame. These are all the problems that happen to us or cause, our, cause us trouble in this world. These problems happen every day to everyone, from the beggars under the bri- living under the bridges to the angels living in paradise. The beggars are always hoping, always have the problem of what to eat in wanting to eat better and better than before, and then hoping for, for pleasures of the flesh as, many, as much as they can come by them, and then seeking for fame, at least as much fame as a beggar can get, to have a higher status or to be better than at least the other beggars. Then on a little higher level, the, the laborers and the ordinary peasants and farmers, and then the, the merchants, the civil servants, the businessmen, the professionals, and then the more powerful sectors of society, people with influence and power. All of these are aiming for food, flesh, and fame on higher and higher levels, on more refined or higher levels, all the way up to the so-called divine beings or celestial beings or angels or gods, whatever we wish to call them in, in paradise. They have these three things as the basic problems of daily life. Even the, even the angels in heaven. They want to eat food that is always more expensive, more, more rare, more hard to find. And people overdo this to the degree that there are all kinds of diseases due to eating improperly. And then as for sensuality and sex, this, people are trying to get this in all kinds of different ways to the degree that drug addiction, alcohol addiction are serious problems around the world. And we have different kinds of diseases now, even the very dangerous one of, of AIDS. And then people, because of a, a fame and honor, People aren't able to, to be humble to each other or to really respect each other or to give in to each other. And so we have all kinds of fights and wars around the world because of fame and honor. Every day these things are causing problems for all levels of sentient beings. Some of you might be wondering, does this apply also to beings that are of a less, less development than, than people? This is something we ought to examine. This dog's name is Duke, 
and he's, he's quite old now. In the past, he would eat <clears throat> just a plain plate of rice. You didn't have to have anything added to it, and he was happy to eat except just a plate of rice. But now, there's got to be meat with it, and only certain kinds of meat. He'll, he'll choose, and he won't eat certain kinds of meat. So now he's got problems with food. And then a, some, there are days where he's got big problems with the flesh. He won't eat. There are days when he won't eat at all and he becomes very thin because he's busy chasing after female dogs. And then he also has problems with, with fame. If any other dog tries to sit in this place, he'll get very upset and try and chase it away. So even, even Duke here has problems with food, flesh, and fame. In the past, you didn't have to call him. He'd come by his, on his own. But now you have to call him and he just sits there. And you have to actually hand him the food. So he's got, he's got problems about fame and honor and status. And he's become very lazy these days. Then there's, there's another one named Noka, who's still quite young. And so he doesn't have any of these problems yet. And so we, we have to say that this problem, problems about food, flesh and fame exist from ordinary common animals all the way up to divine beings, the, the devas in heaven. So then we now must ask the question, what is going to solve this problem of food, flesh and fame in daily life? For the external side of this, as far as material, physical things, then we can say that one's wife, one's friends, such as one's doctor, can help us to solve the material aspect of these problems. They can help us to deal with the, the external side of it. But when it comes to our feelings and awareness inside, there isn't any friend in the world who can help us. There isn't any human friend, at least, who can help us. The only thing that can help us with food, fame, and flesh in, as an inner problem, the only thing that can help is Dhamma. When we're talking about defilements inside of us, there's no human friend that can help us. There aren't any angels or heavenly beings anywhere that can help us deal with inner defilements. There's nothing, there's no object or thing or place that's holy or sacred which can help us deal with inner defilements. The only thing that can help us is Dhamma, that is appropriate for the specific situation and problem, dhamma that is on the, the proper level, which we, are, we call lokutara dhamma, dhamma that leads beyond the world, dhamma that takes us above the world and frees us from the world. good friends, a good doctor, and so on, can only help us to deal with the, some of the external problems. But they can only help with some of them. They'll never be able to solve them all. Only Dhamma can solve all the problems. That is, if it's Dhamma on the highest level, the, the Loguttara Dhamma, which we're speaking about. If you are successful 
in your study of Paticca Samupada and are successful in your practice of Anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing meditation, then you will have this kind of Dhamma which can solve all problems, outer as well as inner. We've already said that if we, the fruits of understanding dependent origination and mindfulness with breathing leads to us having the highest Dhamma, the Dhamma that we call a Dhammayata. We've already discussed this with you a bit, but we need to enliven your memory a bit. The meaning of a Dhammayata is secure. The mind that is so still and secure that nothing can come and concoct it, that nothing can stir it up or cook it up. This security of mind, this perfect security of mind, is the essential meaning of a Dhammayata. We can call this in the ordinary language of ordinary people spiritual equilibrium, maybe spiritual balance would also work. It's where the mind has an equilibrium or balance where it won't be pulled off into the positive or into the negative. From With this secure balance, it can't be influenced or affected or concocted in any way. We'd like to stress the the secure balance of Adamayada. Remember that even the great mountains of the world, the Himalayas in Asia, the Alps in Europe, and the Rockies in America, that these can still shake and tremble when there are seismic tremors or earthquakes. But Adamayada won't shake or waver or move at all, no matter how much the earth shakes. We want to stress the, the unshakableness, the firmness, the stableness of the mind with a Dhammayada. We want even children to understand this, that the beautiful young woman with a Dhammayada can't be picked up or deceived by even the most smooth ladies' man. Or that the handsome young man with a Dhammayada won't have his head turned by even a herd of Miss Universes and other beauty queens. But now a bottle of beer or whiskey can drag their mind off, or <clears throat> gambling, or nightclubs, bars, massage parlors can turn somebody's head and drag them away. This is because no one has a Dhammayata. They can, it can grab one, things can grab us in the wickedness we already have and drag us off into some other form of wickedness and then from there to another one around endlessly. This is the mind that is unstable. This is the mind that's shaking and trembling, that can be pulled off anywhere. It has no balance, no security, because it lacks a Dhammayata. A Dhammayata will help us to cut through all problems of positivism, 
and negativism. Any sense of positive or negative, all this is just arising through the flow of itapajayata conditionality or paticca samupada dependent origination. Equally, the positive and the negative are equally just this flow of dependent origination. There isn't really any dualist dualism in these things. This opposition between positive and negative doesn't really exist. All things are just this flow of dependent origination. If you look at all the pairs of opposites, such as good and bad, winning and losing, profit and and debt, um, advantage and disadvantage, and so on. If you have a Dhammayada, or if you don't have a Dhammayada, you'll see all these things as opposites. But if you have a Dhammayada, you'll see that they're all equally the flow of conditionality, of dependent origination. The Jews of thousands of years ago taught this matter of being free of the positive and negative, being above the positive and negative. Taoism, thousands for more than a few thousand years, has taught to be beyond yin and yang, to be above yin and yang, which is the positive and the negative. In India, the Hindus have for more than for thousands of years taught to be beyond good and evil, punya, which is good or virtue, and bapa, which is evil or sin. To be above this and to go to be with the paramatman, the supreme soul or being or whatever. And then Buddhism appeared and also taught to be beyond good and evil, to be beyond punya and bapa but in voidness, in universal voidness or eternal voidness where nothing can do anything to us. This knowledge has been around for thousands of years in all corners of the world, but humanity has forgotten it. Humanity ignores it. Nobody is interested in being beyond positive and negative, the good and the bad, punya and papa, being free. Nobody is interested in voidness. Those of you who are Jewish or Christian, we request that you go back and read the first pages of the Bible, the second, especially the second chapter of Genesis, where God forbid Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He warned them if they ate this fruit, they would die. Please read this carefully and ponder upon its very profound meaning. When, when we're living in our mother's womb, we have no problems of positive and negative. When we're newly born, there still isn't any difficulty over positive and negative. But once our nervous system and sense organs begin to function fully, then we begin to have feelings of positive and negative. And then all the problems of food, flesh, and fame begin for us. This is the starting point. The, the arising of positive and negative is the starting point for all the problems of food, flesh, and fame. The 
danger and harm is equal in the positive and the negative. These both can harm us. If we're too much caught in the positive or too much caught in the negative, it'll keep us from sleeping soundly at night. It can even prevent us from sleeping at all. When the positive and negative disturb our minds too much, it's harmful to the degree that we can't even sleep well. The positive is just as dangerous as the negative. Gladness is tiring in a glad way, in a happy way. Sadness is tiring in a sad, sorrowful way. Both of these are debilitating and exhausting. Both of them are dangerous in their own ways. Both of them <coughs> cause us all kinds of problems in ordinary life. They are not normal. They're not the state of calm and peace that is normal for the human mind. When we mm. study Paticca Samupada until understanding it correctly and then practice anapanasati until realizing these things directly deep in our own experience, then we will have a dhammayata. We practice until seeing that all these things are void. They're void of self. There's no selfhood in any of these things that we take to be positive and negative. This voidness of self is called sunyata, sunyata the voidness. Seeing this, we see that things are void of positive and negative. They're just what they are. They're just thus. We see this, this balance or stability in things, this which we call tatata, tatata the thusness of things, they're the balance of things, that they're not, they're neither positive nor negative. And this, when this stable balance develops to its fullness, it, this is called a dhammayata, a dhammayata, where nothing can touch the mind, nothing has power over the mind. The highest result of insight, the, the highest insight knowledge or understanding is that of a dhammayata. The highest state or quality of mind is a dhammayata. This is to be the adhammayo the one who is a dhammayata, the unconcocted one, which is the same as the arahant, the fully awakened being, which is the highest goal, the highest goal of Buddhism. When there's no adhammayata, then the positive feelings arise, which give rise to positive kinds of defilement, such as greed, lust, jealousy, possessiveness, and greedy stinginess, and so on. And there arise negative feelings, which give rise to the negative defilements of aversion, anger, hatred, and so on. If there's uncertainty as to whether it's positive or negative, if we're not sure whether something is positive or negative, this gives rise to the, delu the defilements of delusion, of doubt, of 
worry. These various <clears throat> kinds of positive feelings give rise to the greedy kinds of defilements. Negative feelings give rise to the hatred kinds of defilements. And uncertainty whether something is positive or negative gives rise to the delusion kinds of defilement. When there is, when there is a dhammayata, there is nibbana. Nibbana means coolness. <clears throat> Don't confuse it with death. A lot of people have misunderstood nibbana and explain it as being death or something that comes with death or only happens after death. This is very confused understanding. Nibbana, the meaning of Nibbana has nothing to do with death. So please don't go understanding things the way these confused people have. Nibbana just means coolness, genuine, real coolness. The coolness that isn't the opposite of heat. Many of us think that coolness is the opposite of heat. But Nibbana is the coolness that has no opposite. Ordinary coolness or coldness still has temperature. It still has some degree of heat. It's just a very low level. In the ordinary way of thinking, there's coolness with low temperature and heat with high temperature. But the coolness of Nibbana has no temperature. It's complete freedom from all heat. This is the perfect coolness that is the result of having a Dhammayada. This is a coolness or Kwam Yen that is spiritual, Tang Yan. It's not a physical coolness or Yen Tang Gai. It's, it's spiritual. In the, in the mind. Don't confuse this spiritual coolness with ordinary physical or material coolness. Nibbana means this spiritual coolness or Kwam Yen Tang Winyan. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about this Nibbana or coolness until it is understood. The first kind of, there are two basic kinds of Nibbana. The first is called Saupadisesa Nibbana, which means Nibbana where there's still some remainder. This some remainder means there still remains feelings of positive and negative. But this is Nibbana, so there's this positive and negative isn't able to concoct greed, hatred, and delusion. There's still some feelings of positive and negative, but they aren't attached to, and so they can't bring up the fires of defilement. This is called Saupadisesa Nibbana, Nibbana with some remainder. The second kind of Nibbana is called Anupadisesa Nibbana. And in this there's no feelings of positive or negative left at all. One doesn't feel positive or negative about anything in any way. This is the Nibbana with no remainder, the Nibbana with nothing left. To make it very simple and, and brief, we can say the first kind of Nibbana still has positive and negative, but these can't do anything to the mind. And in the second kind, there's no positive or negative left at all. In the first kind, there's still some natural remainder of positive and negative. It's kind of instinctual feelings of positive and negative. But this isn't fuel 
for defilements of greed, anger, and delusion. In the second kind, there's none of this fuel at all. There's not even one drop of the fuel of positive and negative. In your ordinary lives, you can live with feelings of positive and negative, but prevent them from blazing up into fires. You can prevent this fuel from igniting into the defilements. Or even better than that, you can live without any feelings of positive and negative. You can be totally free of these, totally cool, as you live your ordinary daily existence. When we can control these feelings of positive and negative, so that they don't turn into fires, then, then our life is cool in our, our everyday life. Food, in this way then, there's no way, when we can control positive and negative, there's no way that food can be of any danger to us. There's no way that flesh can endanger us. There's no way that, f that fame can harm us or hurt us in any way. When there is this coolness, when we can control positive and negative. So for example, with, with food, if it feels delicious to you, or if it feels not delicious, that's okay. But you can control this so it doesn't ignite fires of, of greed or lust or, on the negative side, aversion or revulsion or anger regarding food. We can control this positive or negative even if the food tastes delicious or whether it tastes not very good this won't have any power over the mind. The mind can stay free of the food. As far as sensuality and sex, whether we get, we get it in a form that pleases us or displeases us, or whether we get it at all or don't have any this won't lead to any defilements. If we get the sex we're looking or if we don't get any, it won't lead to feelings of positive or negative. Or if we get, we, we satiate the sexual instinct, then whether we get heaven from it or we get a disease from it, this won't this won't stir up the mind. And then with, with fame, we're not interested in fame at all. Whether fame comes or fame goes away or there's never been any fame at all, we're not interested. All we're interested in is being correct, in, in correctness, in truthfulness, in trueness. And then when there is perfect trueness, perfect correctness, then we naturally get the highest kind of fame, which is a spiritual kind of fame. It has nothing to do with worldly fame. When there's a spiritual fame, there's, there may be no fame at all in the world because many in the world don't respect this. But there is a fame which is spiritual or beyond the world. We could put it this way. One won't have anything to do with the dirty fame and honor as things work in the world. One will have the pure fame and honor of God. We won't have any problems with food, flesh, and fame when there is thorough understanding of Adamayada, 
the understanding that is totally above positive and negative. We must develop our understanding beyond the ordinary level until it becomes the most correct and appropriate activity or action. We must develop our understanding until it becomes right action. Duke here, all he has got is instinctual understanding, instinctual knowledge, a natural kind of jnana or knowledge. But we as human beings, have the potential to develop our instinctual knowledge higher and higher until we have a thorough and profound understanding of Adamayata. Duke here isn't able to study dependent origination and he can't practice anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing. So he's unable to develop beyond his un instinctual understanding. If we have correct understanding, we see that there is just this flow of conditions dependently originating in this ceaseless flow. We see that there's nothing positive or negative. We realize that these are just concoctions of the human mind. When something pleases them, people say it's good. When something displeases them, people say it's bad. Good and bad have no reality. These are just concoctions of the mind according to what pleases us and displeases us. If we like it, we say it's good. If we dislike it, we say it's bad. But people have different likes and dislikes, and so they can never agree on what is good and what is bad, and they're arguing about it all the time. Good and bad are just conventions concocted out of human thought. They're concocted out of the feelings of positive and negative. When we, when we possess this thorough experience of dependent origination, we realize that the illusion of all this good and bad, positive and negative, and see just the flow of conditions. Even if you call it good or positive, even if you use these words, don't go and attach to it and put yourself at the mercy of these, these concoctions of the mind. Even if you must say something is bad or negative, you don't have to believe in it and attach to it. If we do, these things bite us. If we attach to these words about positive and negative, good and bad, then they bite us. The positive ones bite us in a positive way. The negative ones bite us in a negative way. But they bite us and claw us and gnaw on us in the equally. So the thing is not to attach to these things to be free of their power, to not be at their mercy, to be above all thoughts, feelings, and words about positive and negative. When we don't understand Bhatichya Samupada, we look and we see a chicken and a dog. But when we realize the truth of dependent origination, all we see is a flow, a stream 
of conditions. We no longer see a chicken or a dog. We don't see a person or an, an individual person. We just see this flow of conditions. We don't see female and male. We don't have any more problems about male and female, any arguments and struggles over male and female because we see the flow of conditions dependently arising out of each other. Even more refined than that, there's neither this nor that. There's neither here nor there. When we see this constant flow of conditions, there's no longer oneself or, or others. There's neither the whole nor the parts. There's neither short nor long, white or black. When there's this thorough and constant realization of dependent origination, there's no longer this or that. In short, there's no positive and there's no negative. These don't arise when we, when there is realization of dependent origination. And so one is totally free of the problems of food, flesh, and fame. Now let's consider the benefit of anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing. Regarding the gaya or body, whenever we wish to have a cool body, we can adjust, regulate, improve the breathing until it cools the body, so the body is thoroughly cool, which doesn't mean dead, it just means no defilements disturbing the body. Whenever we want a cool body, we can do so with anapanasati, once we have mastered that part of the practice. However, no matter what state the world is in, no matter how much chaos and confusion and stress, to heck with all that, we'll have a body that's, that's cool and calm in the way we, we need it to be through the power of anapanasati. As for mastering the, the vedana, the feelings, we can, we can cool all feelings of positive and negative so that there's no, there's no coming up of greed, lust, fear, anger, worry, envy, jealousy, excitement, boredom, and so on. We can cool the feelings so that no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what great excitement or great tragedy, we can cool our feelings so that we can stay cool amidst a very hot world. In the third stage of anapanasati, one can totally master the mind so that there's no feelings of positive or negative at all. When we can master the mind like this, we have total mastery over the world because then there's nothing in the world that has the power to make us positive or negative. We have total freedom over the world. In the fourth stage of practice, we master our own ignorance. The last thing that can disturb us is mastered through this, this last part of the practice. So that the ignorance, there's no ignorance at all. We see thoroughly that there's nothing positive or negative anywhere. 
there's there's no hint or inkling or anything of positive or negative left when we can master our own ignorance. And then we are totally cool. We're perfectly, thoroughly cool. We can master craving or dhanha. We can master attachment, upadana. We can master all the defilements, the rebirth of new defilements. And we aren't, we don't get lost, we don't go astray in superstitions. All these attractive, special, magical things that can attract us, that seem so positive or negative to us, we aren't led astray by these in any way. Please understand the words above the world or above and beyond the world. We need to understand what it is to be above and beyond the world. When we're in the world, the world pulls us and pushes us all over the place. But to be above or beyond the world is to be above and beyond all problems of the world. This body is in the world. This body is always in the world. But the mind can be above and beyond the world. This kind of mind is not, this kind of mind that is freed from the world by the Loguttara Dhamma cannot be troubled or suffered by the world in any way. This isn't some kind of in-between state. Many people think, well, this is sadness and this is happiness and we're talking about some indifferent in-between place in the middle. We're not talking about that. Instead of, it's not between the negative and the positive, it's above the negative and the positive, beyond, totally beyond the negative and the positive. We'd like to point out one special thing, or add one special thing. It's possible that science will continue developing and will develop further and further to the stage that it can actually produce a pill that will do away with all greed, anger, and delusion. It's possible that science will be able to develop a pill that will control all of this positive and negative. And then you can take one of them each day and you won't have any problems with positive and negative, food, flesh, and fame, and so on. But then your body will start to develop resistance to this, and you'll have to take more pills and more pills and more pills. You become more and more dependent on or de addicted to this material remedy. So even if science can develop to this degree, it can never compete with the Dhamma. It will never, can never take the place of the Dhamma to which there's no, no possibility of developing resistance. Is the Dhamma is inside. It's not some need to depend on something outside. This Loguttara Dhamma, that we've been talking about will lead to a freedom that's complete, total, eternal, instead of just a merely temporary dependency kind of freedom. So now we've been this this long discourse 
is to help us to understand that if we have the Loguttara Dhamma, the Dhamma above and beyond the world, then we can, we can fight with and overcome the defilements, whether we're on the, the level of, of beggars or we're the highest angels or gods in heaven that with the Loguttara Dhamma we can, we can overcome all levels of food, flesh, and fame, whether the lowest level or the, the very highest. So finally, thanks for being good listeners. It's been over an hour and a half. We wish you the best success in finding the Loguttara Dhamma so that you will have no problems in your ordinary life, that you can be totally free of all positive and negative in, in your lives. Thank you. And so may we end today's, today's meeting. <laughs>